I will introduce our presenter to the panel, Dr. Wendy Hilton Morrow uh, from Augustania College, and Dr. Kimberly Lawler Sagarin from Elmhurst College, uh, and Ben Hammerding from St. Norbert College. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, thank you for uh, hanging out after lunch. <laughs> I think everyone's on the train and headed to the airport. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very excited that you're here. <laughs> so, thank you. And thank you uh, for the inter introduction. We thought we would start by saying a little bit about what we do uh, at our different institutions um, to explain why we got brought into this project. So, at Augustana College, I am uh, the associate, associate Dean of Faculty Development and Academic Initiatives. I've been in that position for about three years, prior to which I was a faculty member in Communication Studies. Um, and this was the first project handed to me by the outgoing Associate Dean, mm -hmm. um, who at one point said, oh, there's this TIGO grant we have in, but don't worry, we don't see it getting funded. And literally, day one, said, I need your CV because you're replacing me on the project. So, <laughs> um, I work closely uh, with our Center for Faculty Enrichment on our campus um, as well. So, that's who I know. I have to talk about that. So, um, I, I'm actually an Associate Professor in the Chemistry and Biochemistry Department, and I'm also Director of our Center for Scholarship and Teaching, which is our Faculty Development Center. If I could speak, all right, again. <laughs> well, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm an instructional technologist at St. Norbert, and I came onto this process really late um, in the game uh, to, to be an instructional designer. Um, so I'll probably talk about kind of that, that part and, um, you know, what, what my perspective as an instructional designer was in this, working with faculty and kind of seeing both sides, but also not really knowing much about the project at all until sort of I started working on it. <laughs> so, and then uh, I replaced Sunday, um, and Sunday was, she kind of kept the whole thing together um, throughout this whole process, and she left our college in St. Norbert, and went to Davidson, <clears throat> and she's still involved in the project, but couldn't be here today. So mm -hmm. I replaced her about three weeks ago, and I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, So this came out of an original partnership referred to uh, as Blaze, which were six colleges in the Midwest uh, who had partnered up to really think about how we could be supporting our faculty's needs when it comes to technology in the classroom. Um, two schools dropped out. I, I didn't, I well, they're still in the consortium, but yeah. they didn't want to participate, in this, didn't want to participate yeah. in, in this project. Um, and so that left the four schools. Um, if you're not familiar with our location, uh, three of the schools are in Illinois. Um, that's Augustana Rock Island as opposed to Augustana University uh, in South Dakota. Um, and then St. Norbert uh, is up in the Green Bay area. So we're all Midwest schools. Um, and so, yeah, today we're spending our time together uh, giving you an overview of this project, um, both in terms of the process as well as the product. Um, I think as an administrator, I increasingly think about what's the process and, and how you make it it works. So we're hoping that you'll have takeaways not only to know about what this, these modules are and how you might even think about using them at your own schools as we try to spread word about them, but also we imagine that there's some takeaways where you could learn from our experience um, in terms of organizations people get involved, uh, some of the nuts and bolts um, on the technology side that we learned as well. So that's what we hope to be covering. So yes, as you heard in the introduction, we received a three-year TIGO grant, $280,000 to develop um, a repository of online tools around three key competency areas, information fluency, communication, presentation skills, and technological adaptability. I'll get into what those actually mean uh, in a minute. You probably have a sense of two of them, technological adaptability. It took us about the first year and a half to figure out what that we all meant by that. Um, but our a grant project is a little bit different um, than some of the grant projects that were funded by Teagle in that in that program, which was the hybrid learning and residential and social arts college grant. And Kimberly was going to just mention how we're a little bit of an odd duck in the way uh, we <laughs> yeah. approach things. So uh, many of the other, uh, there's a, lots of diversity within that grant program, but um, many of the other ones that had um, larger consortiums um, were having faculty apply 
then for grant money to develop something within that. And so those were more led from the faculty up. And ours was, we had already decided what the areas were, and then we were putting faculty to work on them. So it was a, a different sort of thing than some, and presented some challenges. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so <coughs> what is interesting is none of us were directly involved when the grant uh, was originally created. The, the person um, I replaced uh, was involved at the grant writing level along with um, an instructional technologist from Elmhurst, from the former uh, head of IT um, at St. Norbert. <laughs> um, so we sort of had all of these people uh, involved who had different parts um, had to step away um, from the project. But at that time, my understanding is um, it wasn't necessarily a we will determine <laughs> uh, what our faculty should be teaching and what they need to know. Um, but at that point, it was really reaching out to faculty um, and trying to understand what, what are some areas, what are the competencies that our students need to be working on. Um, and if you're familiar with AAPME's LEAP initiative, you'll see some alignment with that, uh, with some of Lumina's uh, sense of what our colleges should be coming away with. They align with that. If you look at all of our campuses' st student learning outcomes, it would, all of those things uh, were informing what these competency areas were. So in terms of what are were the goals uh, for the project, both we had project level goals as well as the modules themselves. And so the, at the project level goals, um, it included first and foremost that it was a useful and transferable tool set would be created, which means the development of online learning modules that are useful to faculty and successfully integrate into a broad range of courses across discipline, um, across different disciplines. And, that's something you'll be hearing quite a bit and, and what are the upsides and the downsides of trying to develop a tool set uh, that works for everybody. <laughs> um, there's advantages, but there's also some disadvantages. Um, and the tool set, uh, the modules that we did create um, in our second go round of uh, the launch, um, I believe we are at 34 courses across the four campuses that are using them in a range of disciplines. And, we may talk a little bit more about how we see them being used outside of traditional classroom spaces as well. So the second project goal, level goal, was collaborative faculty-led process um, so that this really wasn't top-down. Um, we need the legitimacy uh, of faculty who know what their students uh, need and so that they would be the ones who are actually developing the content and bringing that expertise and that they would be multidisciplinary and multi-institutional teams. Again, you're going to see it gets a little trickier <coughs> um, in the ideal as opposed to the practical, and we'll talk more about that. And then finally, community engagement, the promotion of learning communities across the participating campuses, as well as the dissemination of information um, about these learning modules um, throughout the process, and then that's why we're here, uh, that we would share our experience with others as well. Um, and so then at the module level, I mean, at base, we're attempting to enhance student learning, what we're all doing, why we're all here today. Um, in terms of measurable gains, that there are improvements in students' understanding. Um, mastery uh, is a term that was used in the grant. I wouldn't say that. Uh, I think we pulled back from the idea. <laughs> we should be, our students should be mastering uh, these areas, but at least uh, growing in confidence in these areas. And then the transferability of knowledge, so that students don't just use them in one class, forget these skills, but can carry them all over, which all of us as <laughs> higher ed instructors are always hoping our students will do well compartmentalization to actually carry those skills over. So, so uh, to give you a sense <laughs> of how complicated uh, the grant writers <laughs> uh, um, which we were talking about, in some ways it looks crazy. It, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, what you'll see is it's really informed by the way we tend to think about how you write external grants. Um, maybe what they hadn't really thought about is how you normally think about an external grant for one institution. Multiply times four gets complicated. Um, so there is actually, uh, there's, these are actually color coded <laughs> by our school colors. Um, but the idea, this is what it was originally uh, to look like. And we can talk about how some of those changes happen, have happened, but that there was this 
giant steering committee, um, which was made up of a project director uh, from each of these campuses. So all the project directors were also on the steering committee. I am the project director, head of Santa. Uh, Kimberly is the project director, who originally had two project directors. Yes, yes, at Elmhurst. And so each campus had has a project director who has that responsibility. But what our roles are are different. So I'm an associate dean. Uh, we have director of a, a teaching uh, center. Um, we had head of IT at St. Norbert. And so what those roles are um, are a little bit different. It creates opportunities, but then also <laughs> what that means is different. Um, also at the steering committee level, uh, we managed had originally imagined that every campus would bring a second person on board. Um, and again, who those people were varied by campuses. So at Augustana, it was the director of the library uh, we thought should be involved. Um, and it also, at different times, um, provosts and deans of colleges popped on <laughs> and showed up at meetings. Um, and then largely a lot of people were saying, why do I keep getting these notices from base camp? I, I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and so then the idea that we would all uh, eventually have a project manager. Um, and Kimberly will talk about how that also shifted and changed. But let me say, this person, I actually should have made this person look this mm -hmm. big. It was this. Like, they should, should have been a part. Mm -hmm. like, I love project manager yeah. and how crucial that was. Um, and then for each of the modules, um, not each of the modules, <laughs> um, that for each of the modules, there would be a representative from each campus um, in theory <coughs> across different disciplines. Um, and then one of them, uh, and everybody smiled through the entire process, I think it was key. <laughs> but that one of them uh, would be the lead. Um, and so we had leads from different campuses on each of the modules. Um, we imagined that there'd also be campus advisory groups. So for instance, since our Center for Faculty Enrichment was not directly involved in it, they would be sort of a, a campus champion. And so every campus identified who their other champions would be. Um, we, of course, involved our uh, educational technologists from our campuses, and then eventually external instructional designers. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have someone on DOT. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, Spoiler alert. Yeah. So we will talk about some of that. But one of the takeaways uh, <laughs> might be, it sounds beautiful on paper to suggest you will involve everyone on everyone's campus, but in reality, it, it can look like <coughs> I would say it was exponentially more difficult, not just like a multiple of four, it was like, you know, <laughs> the fourth power mm -hmm. of Yeah, it definitely though allowed us to measure the limits of collaboration, mm -hmm. both within and across campus, campuses. Um, so in terms of what the project process uh, looked like, um, starting from the beginning, and so that preparing stage, that would have been uh, beginning 2014-15, uh, so we think 2014-15, 15, 16, 16, 17, um, to see what we had moved through. And so originally, um, the first was just recruiting faculty um, across our different campuses. And so we had put together um, a call for faculty to participate. Uh, and it was incentivized. I mean, we did receive financial compensation. Um, we didn't always get <laughs> good matches or we didn't have anyone from one campus interested in an area. For instance, we didn't have anyone apply for technological adaptability on my campus. A couple of people I thought would be brilliant at it had too much on their plate. So somebody wanted to do information fluency, you know, sort of begged and moved them with technological adaptability. And so some of those were great matches, and other ones I would say were stretches uh, in terms of the faculty that we got. Um, and then after that, um, gathering campus input. So we all did that in different ways, but getting feedback. Um, about what it was our faculty felt that they needed in these three areas. Um, and then the collaboration within teams. Um, we can't emphasize enough uh, how the, the importance of face-to-face -face meeting time is, which again, when you're trying to get all of those people to travel somewhere, <laughs> um, can be a little bit difficult. Um, but to bring it all together and spend a couple days periodically um, to start brainstorming, that, that was what we did in that first year. Um, in the second year, we moved into the production stage, and this is when we uh, had to identify what platform we would be using, our external instructional designers, and we actually had a change um, in who was doing our instructional design at one point in the process. Um, and then continuing to go back 
uh, to our campuses, showcasing where we're at, gather input, um, and then roll out the pilot modules, um, a pilot of the modules. And that was fairly small, um, somewhat by design, um, but also when they rolled out, wasn't necessarily perfect um, for when faculty would have been making decisions because you can have a plan for when they're supposed to be wrapped up and ready, but there are realities. Uh, the upside is we had different schedules, so August Man is on trimesters. Uh, the other schools are on semesters. That This is one area where that was a benefit uh, because it might be a little too late for the semester schools, but hey, we're about to start up a new term. But exactly like when the perfect time to roll out the modules was, wasn't necessarily clear. Um, we'll talk more about uh, why we realized we kind of need to go back to the drawing board on some of them. Sorry that there's uh, a bright light uh, on that. But really, in the next year, it was, we thought it would be tweaking the modules. Um, over last summer, it was over all of the modules. Um, and, then, and in fact, in, in one, bringing on somebody, all a different faculty member all together to start from scratch. So we've done a lot of work in the last year um, and then in starting uh, around January is when we finally rolled out the modules we felt a lot more confident in and, and that's where we're at and then we're currently in the process of some of the assessment work. And let me know if this isn't enough light for you to follow. Yeah, I was afraid that it would like to be That's fine. Yeah, like I, just as an example, I came into this process in the revised stage. That's where like the beginning of last last summer so <coughs> I was asked to, to do it yeah and, and we didn't necessarily imagine that our own IT folks would be involved in that process but as, as we imagined a larger overhaul um, that we had budgeted for <laughs> um, we got some of our own folks involved in that um, so in terms of the product um, you have a, what you have in your hand um, I wish uh, Sunday who's our project manager were here because she loved the idea that you can fit this in her pocket. Because who wouldn't like <laughs> carry it with them wherever they go? <laughs> um, we used this when we were rolling out the modules with our faculty so that they would have. Um, so those are our three competency areas uh, that we were working with that I'd, I'd mentioned before. Um, and so the first one being that information fluency, which I, I think most of us are pretty familiar with, the idea of ability to locate, select, analyze. Synthesize, summarize, and integrate information. Um, communication and presentation skills. Um, that shifted a little bit um, so that it's now more of a traditional communication and, and presentation skills way to think about it. We had imagined there might be more thought to how the skills and what you need had shifted and changed with technology. So for instance, now you don't just interview, you might do a Skype interview. Or you might do a presentation where you're not just using PowerPoint, but maybe you're in a different location altogether. And what are the things you need to take into consideration? Um, there would be room for another uh, module that addressed some of that. Um, but based on the expertise on that module uh, group, they were more comfortable um, with the more traditional areas. And then finally, technological adaptability. Um, and so technological adaptability really comes down to the idea that it's one thing to teach our students the programs that they can be using. It's another to teach them to adapt to whatever the technology is at hand um, and to be able to shift and move. And how do you make decisions about what programs you should be using, what technologies you should be using? Um, and so within each of these three areas, you can see there's a different number of modules um, that have been created originally. They were going to be more symmetrical, um, but as the process evolved, um, it turned out they didn't necessarily need to be symmetrical. They all had different needs. And so all of the modules are set up so that they could be used independently. You don't need to put students through a path in which first you do this, then this. Um, you can pick and choose and, and use what you want, whatever is appropriate. So we are going to have some time at the end to encourage you to play in all of them and we'll show you some of show you one of them a little bit more um, in just a minute oh right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry no i just didn't know we were necessarily doing it but i'm adaptable we're good 
technological adaptability. Yeah, so um, credibility and context. This is coming out of our information fluency. Um, and I, I really like our information fluency modules. Having a background in communication studies from more of a humanities perspective, I, I'm going to put a plug in for the one module. Um, and in here, it lists all the modules and what the learning outcomes are for them. But that actually looks at helps students to read um, humanities articles. They're so, you know, so they got social <coughs> science, but the idea of <laughs> how do you even find where the argument is in, a, in humanities articles when you're thinking, oh, there should be a hypothesis and mm -hmm. a discussion, and those things aren't out there. So my personal plug uh, for IF is actually that one. Um, but what I like about all of them is I think our faculty did a good job of trying to start at the meta level. Um, so rather than just diving in um, to these issues, they actually set it up. So when they, in information fluency, when they're to talk, when they talk about, you know, rather than just how do you cite, why do you cite, actually get into intellectual property. And as a concept, where does this come from? And, and why is it important? And how would people that in trouble? Um, and so as Ben's uh, jumping around to some of these slides, what you see here is a little bit different because we have it in the teacher view, which allows us to hop around um, because students can't hop around, which also means some of our slides um, in which they can move backwards, but some of the slides that have video, <laughs> It has to play, how long is the video? <laughs> yeah, they can't just click, click, click. They have to have engagement. So that's why we wanted to show the teacher view um, so that you can move around. Um, and what you'll see is they're all a little bit uh, different. Um, for instance, the, they're interactive, that they're asking the students to answer questions. Sometimes it might not actually matter what the students are answering. Um, it might just be asking their opinion but the feedback they get is individualized um, to what they actually responded. So trying to keep them engaged and responding to whatever they're saying. Some of them, so for instance, do you want to click on the crap test? Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the idea of the crap test that you review things um, as the variables you're weighing when you're deciding whether or not a source is a credible source. They have to actually watch the video um, to learn more about <coughs> what each of these areas are. And then if you go to the next slide, see them, then you actually go and try out the crack test. Um, and so if you go to the next slide. Oh, let's see. There we go. Coming up. Um, so they actually are giving the media giving them examples, online examples, where they have to actually go down and apply the craft test and they have to interact with it. Um, and so we have several of those that are interactive. Um, and then they have to answer questions. In some cases, they have to make sure they get all of the answers correct um, until they can move on. Um, but really, it's an attempt to make them interactive and also to link them out to other sources so that they're actually applying what they're learning as they're learning about it, rather than the <laughs> learn how to do all this, now go do your assignment. They're actually having to go and read, and they can't answer the questions unless they've actually read the Yelp review or, or whatever other review channel it is. We haven't really talked about the platform we chose. Um, it's, it's Smart Sparrow. Um, and one of the advantages of Smart Sparrow is there are a lot of different interact, interactive um, yeah, interactive pieces that you can do with this. You have your standard multiple choice questions. You can do videos, there's drag and drops. Um, there's there are quite a few different things we can do with it, and that that's important too. Because the first go around was not interactive really, and uh, we I think thought we could do a better job with that. Uh, but we had a different company do all the designing on that, and they kind of promised <coughs> us I think that they could do all those things and then didn't. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the reason for the redesign. And um, Kimberly has yeah. some of those examples. Yeah. So, yeah. but Smart Barrels it's, it's a good platform for interactivity. For sure, there's, there's a lot of good modules here <coughs> for that. And are any of your modules adaptable? Do you have any adaptive learning components in them? Yes, yes, that was actually a key feature of, okay. of what we what we needed to do with the second go around, because we didn't really have as much of that in the first mm -hmm. time around. Yep. yep. And actually, you can you can take the modules and like as an instructor at Bryn Mawr, if you grab that, you can take those and adapt them on your own and, and completely create new things off, off of that. 
which is also you know you know part of being open. So. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the development and some of the issues that we face there, just in case you're thinking about doing a cross <laughs> across uh, institutional uh, project like this, or even maybe a cross departmental one would have probably some of the same issues. But um, so as Wendy had mentioned, we have these cross institutional cross institutional teams, one person from each campus. The idea being that then we'd have input from every campus, and then these people would be like the people that then our people would trust because, oh, well, Rachel's on that. We, we, we know that. We trust that. And that they were going to be multidisciplinary. And um, and we were also thinking liberal arts. We do you know critical thinking. We do upper level stuff. So that's what these are going to be about. And when we <coughs> talk with the faculty, the faculty don't want us doing that. They want us to do sort of the flipped classroom stuff. Like, can you give them this basic you know information and basic skills, and then they can apply that in class, and we can try to deal with those more you know, discipline specific and meaty sorts of things, I want to say. So, um, so, and then the other thing that we found was that um, when we got in these teams, we did have diversity of um, uh, disciplines represented, um, but in some cases, some of those disciplines are closely tied, you know, or some of the disciplines are closely tied with the topics of the modules. And we really needed those people in there because it made, like, people got very uncomfortable when you start talking about you know, information fluency in a broad way, and you, you need librarians and faculty to work around there. So, um, so we did both. We basically did both of those things. We had a little bit more content expert um, uh, sort of involvement and um, oversight, and we also um, shifted what we were doing with the modules to what it seemed like people needed, and also what would be more easily transferable across disciplines, because some of those upper level things were not. We found we're not going to be terribly transferable because that's not what people really wanted us doing. So, so thank you for <laughs> advancing the slide. And then there's a couple of things in we've had we've had a lot of issues here and there. Um, but at one point we had there were funds in the grant for a program manager, and we um, we went through the process of hiring one, and that they didn't work out. So we hired somebody external to our campuses to do this, and it it just did not work out, and had to let them go. So. After about three weeks, oh, right. So, but, but we had spent some time in advertising and you know and interviewing, and then and so then our our faculty teams were kind of like they really felt like they were out there, and you saw our crazy structure. You know, there's all these people that have these supposedly like oversight of this, and you know, who's like working directly with them and helping their team move forward, and that was an issue. Uh, then the CIO at St. Norbert at the time just took on the role. Um, until she left to go to Davidson, and then she, then we hired um, Sunday, who, um, and both of them did a great job. But that was like essential. We didn't really start moving forward. We felt until we had a project manager that could actually deal with that that sort of everyday stuff, where you know this team needs help with this, this team needs help with this, this one's like not on track. What are we doing? Um, we had this sort of nice. Ver uh, idea that we would discuss with all the faculty what the intellectual property agreements were going to be and we would come to consensus and yeah that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. So so if you take on anything like this I would say work all that out in advance. You can always change it if you have a if you have that nice collaborative moment where people want something <laughs> different. But we did have in fact one person at least gave it as the reason for leaving the project. I questioned whether that was the only reason but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was it was a little bit of rough because then we were doing it at the back end trying to negotiate all that. And then we also had some people that just got too busy. Like, um, and we had another person who you know, went back to Canada. And so we did not actually think we were going to have like people leaving the teams. And we didn't have that many, but it was enough that it was disruptive. So we had to figure out how we were going to accommodate that. So if you embark on something like that, I would say think about that, because that happens. Um, and, and then the other thing was because we were going to choose the platform later, we hadn't chosen the platform up front, which I think was sort of a fine idea, um, the, that was sort of holding up the development support for the faculty. And we didn't, none of us have had like sort of expert instructional designers lying around <laughs> that could, they could input to this. And there was funding in the grant for that. And so by that whole thing and the project manager, that just sort of set things back a little. Okay. And then um, Ben alluded to our issues with the platform and not the platform itself, but we 
we had an instructional design firm. We vetted them. We talked. They were, we looked at stuff. It all looked great. And then they were going to help us use a platform. And one of the ones they showed us was a new one called Smart Sparrow that has all this <coughs> great analytics that Ben will show. Um, and we were really, we really liked it. And they wanted to get into working with it. And so they kind of encouraged us. And we were like, great, let's go. And it turns out that they weren't, because they, it was new to them, they didn't really know how it worked. And Smart Sparrow is fairly complex. Um, and we got a version that everything was wordy. Um, it was just like, you know, like, you know, some of us were like, I could do HTML better than this, <laughs> you know? Like, uh, there were some design problems, just the whole thing, because I think they didn't have, and the time they budgeted for the project was really not sufficient for the platform and, and stuff in it to be, I mean, I don't know if that's what I'm assuming. Um, and they actually didn't know how to do a lot of the adaptive things, and so they discouraged the adaptability. Like, it's deep with the adaptive. It was, yeah. And a lot of the interactions were really low level. Even the faculty were trying to dream big and do things, mm -hmm. it, it just, um, and so and that contract ended, and we were in discussion with Smart Sparrow, and they looked through the stuff and basically said they don't know how to work with our program, with our platform, but we can help. And so um, we ended up um, doing one where they took on the role of instructional designer on, on a couple modules with the faculty teams, and then they trained some of our instructional designers to then work with faculty teams on their platform. Is that, mm -hmm. am I sort of? They, they assigned you and gave you some they assigned so they gave you access. Uh, I'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, but the, the net result was that we got out more, you know, because the first ones we really had trouble even selling them because we were unhappy with them. So you want to share. So then the next, we have just a couple of screenshots. So, like, this is what I mean by wordy and like, you know, lots of text. And um, whereas here, these are choosing stuff. Go ahead. The next one, we can go through this pretty quickly. And then here again, lots of. Lots of text, but here it's how do you do this? And yeah. So this is, oh, that's why I didn't have to show. That's oh, why. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's, that's, okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's fine. Right. You can go on. That was, we were just going to do. So, um, and then our lot, our assessment, <coughs> both of the grant, one of the things Tegel was really interested in is how can we work together? Because that is a big challenge. Um, so we had an external evaluator come in and they surveyed like everybody on the project. They did interviews with many of us and um, used a lot of instruments on um, things like. Anxiety level about the project and you know the, the sustainability of the project and things like that. Um, and then we've done student and faculty surveys. We did some after round one. Round two just sort of the modules sort of just got going, um, so those are still coming in. And then there's the Smart Sparrow Analytics, which Ben will give a little bit of information about in a moment. But um, can you go next slide? Yeah. So the external evaluator efforts and things that we saw that really sort of helped crystallize them, like the the faculty. Well. The project directors at the various campuses, we had a great setup. We were meeting every week. We were, we were all, we set up a meeting time and we just stayed to stick to it, which helped us like kind of move things forward. We used Basecamp as a way of um, exchanging files. So we always had one place to look. So that was great. Um, and then the faculty teams were very happy with one another and they were actually happy with us. They just weren't happy with the process. And so they actually trusted each other. They were their teams had somewhat bonded, and that was good. But there was anxiety on the faculty teams about the support, that lack of project director, and that sort of stuff that happens. And there was a lot of concern overall about <coughs> sustainability. I mean, it's probably not sustainable to have your CIO at one of the colleges like <laughs> running this program long term. So, okay. And then um, this is just some some of the questions we asked. This is from the version one modules, and one. Of, so these are just the kinds of things we asked. It's not, you know, just did this help you do this? And um, so this is self reports from the students. And you know, they were like, yeah, they were sort of helpful. And, and some even thought they were very helpful. So that was nice, even though these were the first set. So can you go on to the next one then? And then um, this was the stuff we were very unhappy with the design. And yet um, in some of these, like they were actually very satisfied. And we were, we were shocked. <laughs> and this actually, I feel like this goes back to what the session I went to. Uh, one question I went to yesterday on MOOCs, they were talking about how, you know, students are, you know, student videos, they're watching like YouTube and things like, you know, there's a lot of diversity of the stuff that they're interacting with, so they were actually more forgiving than we were or thought they'd be, so. And then I would, Ben's now going to talk about the Smart Sparrow Analytics, because, and this is all early data, but it, like, just, these are just kind of a piece that you can get out of this, which is interesting. 
Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the analytics piece. Um, obviously, that was one of the big things in, you know, how are we doing? How are they working for students? Are we getting are, are we getting out of these what we thought we were going to? And uh, SmartSpur has some really good analytic tool, analytics tools. Um, and I'm going to go through those. I guess I'm going to say a couple things about them. They're, the way we have them set up, the analytics tools are on each individual module. And so you get a lot of good data out of that, but what's really difficult is taking the, the data in aggregate, and you can't really get to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Sunday is the only person that can see everything um, from all of the campuses. And so I can't even at my campus, and I, it's kind of like I took Sunday's job over, sort of, and Daniel's, and, and so I'm kind of in charge of all that at the moment, and I can't see everything that's happening at our campus. I don't even know which modules were used where. And so that, that is kind of a, sort of a problem with Smart Sparrow, and they don't seem to have a way to solve that where we can grab all of our data um, because it's a consortium kind of thing. I think if it had been just our, our, uh, our college, it would be different. Mm -hmm. um, but we are gonna download all of the data. Sunny's gonna do that and kind of give it to everybody at the end, they're gonna do that one time. But that was one thing that I was kind of like, well, as I was looking through this stuff, like, well, where's all the data? I want to see all of it. And so uh, really what you're seeing here is just one particular module, which is the credibility and context piece. So just, just to explain that piece. So the data, the, the analytics are pretty good, but the aggregate data is kind of missing, you know, which can be a problem. Mm -hmm. So for us, grades don't matter. Um, in these, we did, we decided not to do any grading. It was about, um, it was about gaining the skills. Mm -hmm. So, Grades don't matter, and completion may or may not matter either, because in some of the courses, the faculty members said you had to complete all, you had to complete them, and that, you know that's that's the way it had to be. And in other courses, they just you know kind of let them try them out. So completion is kind of a, a rough one to gauge by. But if you were if you were putting these out there, you could get some pretty good statistics and kind of figure out what was going on from this uh, from these analytics. And then the adaptive feedback piece is a pretty big deal because uh, this tells us how many states have uh, activated. Um, adaptive feedback, and you can see that 66% of the time um, they, they were activated, and that means the students were, you know, having to go back and relearn and, and or do something different and probably gain more knowledge, which was good. Um, and then this part is just traffic, which isn't a big deal. Um, so that's what this screen is for, and then so there, there are three. Um, you have the overview, which is what we're on right now, and then the next screen is um, this this one here is a comparison between the same two modules. So we kind of put those up to, uh, against each other a little bit ago. These are the analytics. So that's from the IF module one, and this is what we kind of changed it into. And you can see that the adaptive feedback was quite a bit more in use here because there, it actually was present. Um, and <coughs> so just based upon that, we did have some more, you know, lesson completions with a better. Now it's a pretty small sample because again, it was just one. Not only one module, but one course. So this is one, like, so there's only nine students on this, uh, and obviously a few more students on that one. But this was kind of a good, it was good for us to see some of those things. Uh, a couple other pieces that are important. The median time spent, which is going to be on the next one, is the, the, the maximum amount of time that was spent in any one of the sections of this module, and the first time around was 38 seconds. The second time around, <coughs> four minutes, which means they had to spend a little bit more time. They actually watched, had to watch things and take some time with it. And that was, I think, a good metric for us, knowing that we were kind of being successful and the students not just clicking through it and being done. And then um, completion in many of the modules, and pretty much all the modules was up like 20% in every single one. So that, that, again, as you click through them, you could see that it was actually better because of the adaptive feedback and the better design. This is the, uh, the question explorer piece, and uh, what to, again, average grade didn't matter for us. The mean time spent is kind of nifty. If you hover over any one of these, it gives you this, this data. And so you can, time, you can figure out how long are, on average, are students spending on this question, and how many times did they have to go back to that um, to, to do that. So you can look really quickly and see that, oh, those are really difficult questions. Do we need to go and do something with that, or do we, is that a good thing? Um, and you can also see, as they go along, where people fall off and go, oh, yep, I just gave up. So you can see like maybe maybe in this question, and after that, only three people were left. So you know that you should probably go back and do something with that question. And those are important analytics um, when, you, when you want to keep iterating on your design. Mm -hmm. 
And then the last one here are student results. So you get to see all the students' results for each <coughs> question. Um, this stuff up here is time spent on lesson and the grade, again, the grades don't matter for us. Um, but the results of each question are, are nice because you can go and see what did everybody choose for answers. And we had open-ended stuff. In almost all the modules, there were some open-ended things where the students had to think a little bit more. And what we liked about that was um, that it gave you some quali uh, qualitative data, which we'll show in the next one. So what that allowed for is to, to help instructors um, kind of fill in gaps. So if you notice that many of many of your students are not giving very good, um, not getting very good answers in those areas, or don't seem to know what they're talking about, you as an instructor can now go, I'm going to focus on this for maybe a day in my class. All of my students see me struggling in that, and I can I can target that that thing and, and, and help them out. Um, directed student support. So if you notice that three students really don't get what's going on, you can now you know meet with those students individually and say, let's get you through this and get you caught up to where you need to be. And uh, another one that's important is meeting students where they are. What I mean by that is in these open-ended questions. This is a, a question that said, uh, do you use social media? And if so, kind of what what do you use? So if you wanted to use social media in your class and you were like, I don't know, I don't know what I want to use, but I want to meet the students where they are rather than having them create all brand new accounts. There's good data here. You can't can't read these, but there's like Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, or whatever. So you can look through that and say, well, the majority of students seem to be on Facebook. Let's do a Facebook group for this class, and that's where I want to do you know the online discussions for this course. Um, or you know, you can get a lot of other good data again, meeting students where they are or getting direct student uh, interaction back from, from them. So that's pretty good. Um, so <laughs> these are some like dumb moments that you get at the end, like, oh yeah, I guess, duh. Um, so the part, important part from the instructional designer point of view for me was it's really important that you choose the platform that matches your vision for the whole entire thing and your goals and not choose the platform and try to stuff something into it. It did happen that, that SmartSpare was a good platform, I think, for, uh, for this project. Um, timely collaboration. It, so this guy kind of goes back to, I think the directors were meeting on a regular basis really often, and it was, that was really good. Mm -hmm. And I worked on the, on the CPS modules, and my group was awesome. When we met, we got stuff done. People were all um, on the same page. But there were, there were, that wasn't the same in all of the groups. There were definitely some tensions that we'll talk about um, in the second part here. But the other parts of time and collaboration has to do with SmartSphere itself. In the very beginning, when I came on board, everybody did like these big hangouts with SmartSphere. So it was the faculty, it was the instructional designers. And then they would go through and say, well, here's what you can do on our platform. And then they would get into like all these trap states and all the like, you do this, to do this, to do this, to do this. And so at that point, the faculty members didn't need to be there for that because they weren't going to do any of it. And as an instructional designer, that didn't help me in that point of the process because I wasn't ready to get into that to that yet. I just looked at I looked at my like, pool. Yeah. This looks a little bit more difficult than what people were maybe like telling me it was going to be. Um, and I don't even have the content yet to start putting it in there. So, and that happened really early in the process. And then as we got to the point to actually put it in. We kind of didn't have any more meetings with Smart Sparrow, so it was just like, I would, and it, as an instructional designer, I was one of the first ones to get my modules done, because I, I was like, I need to get this stuff done. I've got lots of other stuff coming up in my plate. If I don't get it done now, it's not going to get done. And other people completed things months after I did, so it wouldn't have even done all that much good to have had a meeting at that point because not everybody was ready for that part. Um, so time and collaboration is important. Like. When do these people need to meet with the people who can help them? Uh, and then last, adaptability is really hard. We, I think in CPS, we had a lot of really grand ideas for how we wanted to do this with all kinds of really cool uh, re video recording modules and stuff. But in the end, once you got into the platform, it was like, okay, this is maybe not exactly how we're going to be able to do this, or it just, it, the platform might limit us in this area. We're going to have to change this a little bit. Um, but as you know, it, like artificial intelligence and machine learning, some of these things are going to become easier, mm -hmm. and it'll help you pick adaptability and probably suggest trap states or it was what they call like it was wrong, what's the next step kind of thing. Um, and then for me, match, my my uh, my pedagogy was very in line with the people that were that the faculty members I was working with, and if I suggested something, they were totally like, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do that. 
but I, I know that that didn't happen in all the other groups, and so that made things go a little bit more slowly. Um, because if you have good matches, then you're going to save a ton of time on, on what's going on. I know that there were some some groups that had uh, instructional designer kind of had to take over and massage the content, and I don't think the faculty members probably always appreciated that part. And so the, the fact that I could work with my group, for the most part, I just said, hey, there, there's these states when something's wrong, what do you want this to look like? And if they felt I could handle it, they were like, you, you can make the decision and, and figure that part out. Or they'd say, all right, well, we're going to add this and this and this, and they would do that for me. So that was, that was nice. Um, and then the last part was just defining roles and, and being flexible with roles, because so kind of like what I talked about, what are what are the faculty members responsible for, and what meetings should they be going to, and when, when do they need to meet? What are the instructional designers for, uh, like responsible for, and where do they need to be in that process? But sometimes that stuff overlaps a little bit, so we had to be a little flexible too. Mm -hmm. uh, and at times, when I first started, I didn't know what my role was. Uh, like I got to the point where it was, I apparently was going to start putting stuff in some material. I didn't even think that was my role. I thought I was just kind of like advising faculty members on creating these things, and so they're like, "Oh yeah, you have to put it on SmartSquare too." And I was like, "Okay, <laughs> I guess I'll figure that out." And luckily, I was able to. Um, and the tool could be better in some areas, and hopefully, they'll make some changes with it. But you know, instead of taking six clicks to do something, it could take. Um, but it, they turned out pretty well, I think. So. So this is just more like takeaways. Uh, could you please? Um, if you were to take on a project like this, we found the project director essential. There has to be somebody who's dedicated to sort of keeping all the parts moving. Um, our organizational structure was not designed for you know ease of use, I would say, um, and so we had to rethink that and, and sort of like I mean it's not like we kicked all the other people out, but like we just sort of we we made some more direct connections and, and didn't use like advisory boards as much and stuff like that. Um, Regular meetings were really important, especially for the project director group. We had regular meetings, and that helped that helped us a lot. And then and these are virtual. These are these, those were yeah. virtual meetings, mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the other teams, you know, did that too. And a lot of times, they did basically only make progress when there's a meeting coming up. And so setting those sort of regular schedules was helpful. And the most, I mean, I think that the sort of most quickly, the quickest group is the sort of the, is the one that Ben worked with, and they're the ones who actually wanted more face-to-face -face meetings. And it's they feel like they would not have made as much progress. And evidence of what the other two groups would suggest that that, I mean, it's, <laughs> there's other factors involved, but it did seem like that group because they made a commitment to meet more frequently in person, actually um, had some more success. And then um, we did have we have had some adoption challenges because again these were these are you know, coming down from on high in a sense, even though they were developed from the faculty by the faculty. They developed the faculty developed the learning objectives and all that. Um, it's still now we're trying to put them in courses and have people adopt them. And people are busy. We're, we have different campus cultures. We have different calendars, as we mentioned. And so, um, and we might have different needs. Um, and I'd say that because we also changed the focus of the modules, we sort of were like, this is, these are things anybody could use. And in terms of actually getting them out there and getting them used, it might have been helpful to have a sort of guaranteed audience. Like if we, if we, just as an example, if we had like all of our first year seminar programs, if we were all gonna adopt all of these modules, that that would have been like having a place to put them automatically would have been very helpful. Cause you know how it is when you're developing a class, you're like, oh, I'd love to put that in. Oh, I don't have time. <laughs> so, so even if you want to, and so having some place, if you're trying to do something like this, having some place to put them, I would say would be ahead of time. And then they could go out further, but just like, you know, having a known target. Mm -hmm. I think even what we promised to Teagle would change now um, because it was we will put them in this many courses, but we didn't really say, well, how many modules in each course? And so, although we only have 34 courses across four campuses, some might be using six modules. You know, some are using one. And, and so, I think we would have rethought that. And I, and I, understand that from the time they were writing the grant they were imagining some outside um, learning opportunities that could happen but we didn't address any of that so i think that's probably the next step we'll be doing is doing more outreach for instance on our campus career development is very in, much interested in the professional communication one and there's even been conversations that before they meet with the career counselor for the first time they have to demonstrate that they've completed that 
because why aren't we doing a flipped uh, meeting and rather than taking up all the career counselor's time on going over these basic skills that they should have. Um, the intellectual property one, uh, we definitely will be using with our international students mm -hmm. as a part of their course so that they understand uh, Western notions of intellectual property and, mm -hmm. and why it matters as opposed to not just how to do it, but sort of the more meta ideas of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. So I think that also in terms of who the audience, not who is actually the audience, but also who should we have said we would have been rolling it out to rather than just picking numbers in classrooms, because especially as we all move towards more integrative learning, we recognize so much of that's happening out of sight traditional classroom spaces. Um, and so then also, this is the thing we continue um, to struggle with is thinking beyond the grant. Um, so we're almost to the end of it. We'll have one more meeting this summer. Um, our project manager's role in it will wrap up probably by August. And so who, who owns this project? Um, we did face some of that in the intellectual property in terms of some of the faculty feel like they should own that content. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but also who owns the data? Um, so who's going to be the person that has access to all of that? Um, safeguarding future access, we went with Smart Sparrow. There is a cost associated with Smart Sparrow. Um, we had enough money left in the grant to guarantee basically two years um, access to all four schools. Um, and then some of our schools had said, you know, they're committed to this and they'll find the money for it after that. However, <laughs> my provost is in the process of leaving. You've had a new, we have a new dean coming in. You have, I mean, so yes. the, the players are changing it. And so there's not really safeguards. Um, for that access, there is a way to pass on the cost to students, um, and some schools have said that's the way we're going to do it. Um, but it's not terribly expensive. For students. Yeah, and it's but not it's terribly. Just, yeah. But anytime you, it's a lot easier for a faculty member to pop in a module in a class and feel like, oh, that's just the one I wanted, as opposed to if I'm going to make my students pay access, then now I feel like I'm compelled to use more and I get what I want to. So it just becomes a barrier. Um, so I think we're still sorting that out. Um, and the way the grant was written is that we would share them um, with other liberal arts schools um, freely, <laughs> pretty much. Um, and maybe we should have built in some nominal cost. And there would, I mean, I shouldn't say free because there would still need to be a way to, to pay for the platform. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's not really a built in additional cost so that we could have a pot of money to make sure they continue on, that they get updated. Um, but we also, along the way, have talked about some of our teams had other modules they would have liked to have done and just didn't have an opportunity to get to. And we think there's a great opportunity for other schools as partner schools, you know, use our modules, work on creating some more until we grow and grow and grow the repository. Um, but I don't know that we figured out how will that work. And knowing that our project manager um, will be stepping away uh, from this means unless all of us get our heads together um, and figure this out pretty quickly, we're not really sure what will happen uh, in terms of allowing it to grow and change and expand, which is unfortunate um, because it's a lot of time and resources put into what right now are useful tools. But in two, three years, I hope they're not just floating out there, <laughs> not being used. Yeah, and uh, I guess the other point from the instructional designer's point of view on that too is that we're tied right now we're tied to smart sparrow mm -hmm. we don't really have a way to move that over to somewhere else mm -hmm. and if, if you guys know anything about software today it's all about containerizing your stuff so you can put it anywhere mm -hmm. and um, being able to easily move it between between systems because mm -hmm. there are some open uh, open resources that we could have potentially used for this that kind of came online after we started that mm -hmm. that are very similar and those would be just straight html and, and css type mm -hmm. stuff um, but that would take a lot of effort i think to go back and redo all that stuff but that would be the only way to kind of guarantee the no cost and mm -hmm. or really low cost and being able to help them. Mm -hmm. And we did also go with Smart Sparrow, part of that decision where the great analytics that yep. the faculty can get it's so that they're yep. really finding out what their students are doing in those. Uh, I want to thank you guys for your great presentation.